Uh, yeah, got two more Okay, so we are now being recorded. Uh, um, welcome back to day three. Um, so here's the agenda. I'll just, I have two more slides and I'll come back to this to, to bash it. Um, these are the URLs, just as a reminder. Uh, Yari has volunteered to help take some notes, um, but I think, you know, people doing it uh, collaboratively is good. So go to the pad and take notes of interesting things. Uh, to be clear, I volunteered to take part of the notes, so other people are doing that as well. It's required, <laughs> not optional. Yeah, so um, more people, better notes, hopefully, yeah. Uh, there's the workshop thing and the Git repo. The slides for today, these slides are in the Git repo. Um, and my uh, last slide is some to-dos. Um, so on the pad, can you check at some point that your name and affiliation is at the t in the list of people at the top? Um, if you go and look at the URLs, if you made a submission, just check the right version because there's some people updated some stuff. Um, we may or may not have gotten it all correct. Uh, for the mic line for today, if if and when we do need a mic line, just use the uh, convention of putting in Q plus or plus Q or something in, in WebEx chat like I just did. And I'll try and keep track of that. If I muck it up, then just yell at me. Um, we, notes are done. Uh, towards the end of today, we'd also kind of look for some feedback about the format of this workshop. Um, you know, any, I, you know, how should we think about this if we're going to have other workshops in future, um, post-pandemic even? Um, and after we'll start drafting or continue drafting the workshop report, I think that's in the Git repo that uh, Maria has created a file there. Uh, so, you know, please do read and comment to that. We'll send mail to the list. So with that, uh, I just oops, I wanted to just bash the agenda. So this is your chance to bash the agenda. Any is everybody happy with that agenda? Understands what it is. Uh, I'm just looking for the slides with DSCP right now. So oh, it's a PDF. Uh, okay. Dominic's sent through a slide to you uh, on email short a short while ago, Stephen. I don't know if you picked it up. I have that, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. so I guess that, that will be in, I presume that's in you know, either the second or third bullet there on security or what we forgot. Okay, if that's agenda looks good, then Cullen. Okay, so... Uh... Jared and I put this together. Um, I'm sort of talking for a second about as an application type of guy that runs stuff over the net network, what I wish the network gave me. And he's going to talk a little bit about <laughs> why I might not be able to get that. Um, <laughs> so let me just jump into this pretty quickly here. Um, so next slide. Um, the particularly as people have moved to doing all this web conferencing, remote learning uh, online, the, you know, we have all kinds of people working from home, obviously. And one of the real issues with that is prioritizing the packets on the uh, downlink to people's homes cable, whatever whatever the technology is for that. There's, there's no way of really doing that. And we end up with all of our stuff really mixed together. And I think that a big observation for me that came out of this COVID thing, and it had to do with, with YouTube and others moving their bandwidth rates down was the last thing in the world that those that the vendors of those services wanted to have happen, maybe not the last thing in the world, but one thing that they were not didn't want to have happen is people say, I've got to go to my class now. The other people in the house need to stop watching uh, Netflix or YouTube or whatever it is because my, you know, my online class doesn't work while you're doing that. Um, so it actually was in their interest to make it possible for people to still use the experience but to reduce the quality of the experience at some level um, in, in a way that that allowed everything to work together. And they went, there's a lot of discussions back and forth between various companies on, the, on this, between various lawyers, and how to decide how to, to do that and make it work. And I, I, it worked out, it, it did work out. Um, you know, most points in time at most places, you could run uh, a video streaming service and a web conferencing application simultaneously. Uh, the the but that would be would have been a crap load easier to do had there been some way to and, and would have worked a lot better if there was some way to prioritize data going down the downlink. 
And for the, we, of course, this has been known for many years to like, do this, but it's always been one of those things like this won't work because somebody else will steal all the bandwidth of it and it won't, there'll be no fair way to allocate it. And I think the observation from COVID that's a little bit, or from this COVID-19 time is, is a little bit different, is that was actually wrong, our assumptions about people's um, motivations. Only the big apps matter, okay? If tons of little small apps decide to steal it, it makes almost no difference. It's only what the large gorillas that use significant bandwidth across people's time do matters. Users at home can turn on and off apps and use them or not use them in ways that control what happens to their network. And they have a desire to have something to have on their network. Um, and the various uh, competing services, whether, you know, YouTube, WebEx, Zoom, uh, Netflix, all of these, um, it's in their interest to find a way to prioritize that traffic to work together. Um, so if there was a, a very simple sort of less than best effort and a sort of higher and lower priority sort of a very minimal diff sort of code point marking on the downlink to the home, I think it would help a lot on that. Um, whether that's possible or not, I mean, th th we'll go to the next slide in just a second here, but that's, that's sort of the desired goal from an application point of view. Does that make sense or any questions about the, the, what the desire is, not the discussion of the reality of delivering that desire? I think Jason has a question in the chat. Ah, L4S. Jason, I, I mean, I, Jason, can you just comment on that and talk about it a little bit? I mean, you're, there's no better person in the world to discuss this than you. <laughs> I, I don't know about that, but, you know, I guess the question is, um, you know, there's been a lot of debate about the sort of last remaining code points in L4S being one of those things. So like a low latency, um, you know, uh, marking that could be used by an app, um, and uh, you know something that Docs networks are working on at the moment. Um, yeah. But uh, you know this has been discussed for a while. I mean, honoring DSCP markings has always been challenging across the main borders, of course. Uh, but uh, you know, this, maybe this is pointing out in your example here a potential use case that would be interesting. So I did. I sort of wonder generally, you know, is that the use case that L4S could fill? Uh, uh, yeah, I think L4S would fill this no problem. Or I think there's many ways to, to skin this cat. L4S I think probably would meet the needs. And I, my personal belief is the first set of ISPs in the world that manage to offer a great gaming experience that's better are just going to have this viral marketing mechanism um, going for them that's going to be insane. Um, but you know. <laughs> I, I, I want to, and so I, I want to jump in here uh, with with I think two things. I think Cullen. I think why don't we go to the next slide? And why don't you do that slide? Well, so so I want oh. to talk about your your slide for just okay. for one second. So I, so so you mentioned just prioritizing the downstream, and you didn't mention prioritizing the upstream. Uh, so if I have multiple different services in my home or multiple different users, there may be different tiers. Maybe I care more about. You know, my place, the chat. I care about my school, kids' school video chat. Or maybe I care more about the, uh, you know, the kids' school video chat than I do, uh, you know, my work chat. Because I can go and move to, you know, a cellular network or something where, the, you know, for my one-hour audio call or something uh, or something else. Um, so so I, I think we need to remember, you know, the, the you know, obviously the Internet is bidirectional. And... There's different buffering behaviors, uh, you know, see, see buffer below that, that, that exist in devices when they end up queuing and prioritizing packets and, and that behavior. So I think we need to be mindful of that. Sure. Um, so to totally agree. I don't mean to over to oversimplify that, but all of these apps, like all of these apps are doing diff serve code point markings across the Wi-Fi network and inside the home and the home wireless routers, NATs, things, whatever do do something with those fairly often. Now, like all the things they do are sort of wrong, but they're not so wrong we can't sort of make it work. So that's, that hasn't been our biggest pain point. And, and and I think the second thing is that quite often there's not, uh, there's, uh, there's not a diversity of provider selection available. And that also poses its own challenge is that, you know, you may be stuck with like a DSL or DOCSIS network option you know, or maybe a fiber to the home versus Doxis as the, as the two solutions. And you may not, it may be challenging for an end user to actually get the network service 
uh, that they desire. So, so even if you say, hey, I, I, I'm going to switch to Jason's network because it's better for gaming, Jason's network isn't universally available because maybe it's Time Warner Cable or something in that area or, uh, or sorry, or Charter or maybe it's, you know, Atlas or some other cable company. I, I, look, I, so we've had many problems about, you know, w whether a broadband access is a duopoly or a monopoly or what cartel or whatever it is. But I mean, that I, this doesn't help solve any of those things. But boy, in the places where there are, I, I, I think that that problem is a separate problem, which will take care of it, which, which does take care of itself, you know, uh, over time. Um, but right now, we don't have the technology for them to compete on that level. Like, there's no, you know, it's difficult, I think, today. I look, I, I shouldn't even say these words. I don't run one of these. You go, well, both, both of you guys do, but uh, it does. It seems difficult for people to compete on this network would be really awesome for gaming uh, or for Zoom calls uh, today than, than just basically, yeah, we offer, you know, however many megabits per second of download. So, so we have a couple of questions. Uh, um, Larry, I think your question was in first and then Andrew. Uh, I, one of the things people have expressed an interest in is just some kind of diagnostic that they could tell whether or not the problem is their problem with their video call is that other people in the house are using up the bandwidth to play games and or it's somewhere down link or it's not even your connection at all it's somebody else's problem it's really hard to diagnose these things either on the fly or at a given time I mean, maybe this is a simple tool that people could use to figure out why their bandwidth is being limited and make an informed choice about, you know, you go and tell everyone to turn up their, their video and it doesn't actually help you at all. Look, it's very true. And this is a constant problem. I think all the, app, you know, people phone up WebEx and say your WebEx call sucks. And we don't know whether it's WebEx was the problem or the Wi-Fi network was the problem, or the WAN link was the problem. And it's generally, it's quite often one of those three, but it's really hard to tell which one of the three to blame. Or it was the so what, what kind of diagnostics or tools could you use to help people make more informed choices? Uh, being able to talk to the access point and get privacy sensitive information about what was going what what was happening across the the Wi-Fi link versus what was happening across uh, the, the the WAN link upstream of that would be really amazingly useful, uh, and and I think that you know that's an area that IETF could drive standards on is it's how to get management diagnostics information from access points um, about the apps on in, a, in about the apps on flows. I want to be very highly privacy sensitive here. I don't think you have to reveal information that the app doesn't already know. You're just revealing which side of the access point the problem happened on. Uh, we had yeah, so so a couple of points just to sort of chime in with uh, their first one, which is also, I think, popped up in the, in, in the chat. Um, the sort of U US markets conditions are not uh, the same. So the, the conditions in other markets are not the same as in the US. Um, uh, so in other words, and I've seen this in, in other fora, so ITF fora, um, there's a low level of knowledge, certainly in some of the uh, uh, apps developers uh, about the conditions that apply in non US markets, uh, which causes decisions to be made which are non optimal in most of the world or lots of other parts of the world, certainly markets are far bigger uh, th than the US. So I think that can be an issue. I'm not saying that's necessarily true here, but it's certainly an issue in, in some discussions. Um, it also occurs to me that to answer some of these questions, um, and again, I've seen these surface in other places, maybe occasionally talking to the, some of the service providers would be a good thing. And I'm not suggesting, by the way, that Cullum wasn't going to get there on on this or, or hasn't done that in the past, uh, I sh should add. Um, and, and then finally, some of these problems could be solved by service providers, I believe, but I would politely observe that some of the uh, developments within the ITF and the direction of travel is, is to obscure a lot of this data to make it impossible for service providers to do 
network management to provide a good user experience. And I don't think some of the people doing the protocols fully understand the implications of what they're doing. Um, and that from an end user experience point of view, that can be really bad. And dare I say, it, not consistent with uh, RFC 8890, for example. Um, so I thought I'd just throw those in for discussion. So actually, I, I, I'll just interject myself briefly before going to Brian with you. I mean, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying, Andrew. However, the people are encrypting protocols for good reasons, and we need to remember that too. So I think we have Brian in the queue. Right, this is uh, WebEx. I get to unmute myself. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to get through this whole thing without saying spin bit. Um, too late. Uh, I think there's like so. I, I, I'm gonna, you know, what I said in the in the, um, the the chat is, you know, a lot of environments, uh, sort of like either cloud development environments or sort of like large, you know, development environments like the one that I deal with at my day job. Uh, give you the ability to do sort of like full end-to-end -end sampled RPC traces, right? And they're super, 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 super useful for figuring out what broke. And a lot of the functionality that um, we're asking for here, like if we built an alternate architecture that was sort of at the RPC layer as opposed to at the network layer, and you had sort of, you know, some sort of like distributed broker thing, like some of the, you know, I think some of the, the, the work in the 1980s was going in this direction, you could actually slot RPC tracing into the internet. You can't do that. Um, a lot of the work that, uh, you know, that is being done to obscure information uh, that has been used for passive measurement in the past is not specifically targeted at obscuring the ability to trace, um, you know, so full end to end. It's, it's, uh, targeted at reducing the amount of unintentional radiation, right? So the um, uh, the amount of data that you didn't actually intend to put in the wire image that's there. Um, I think there is a uh, there is a room for research into how you can get closer to this ideal of full end to end um, sort of flow disposition tracing. Uh, and an on-demand environment, right? This would not be a thing where um, the ISP would say, here are all of the flows and here are all of the end-to-end -end characteristics of those flows. It would be more of a, you know, you click a button in your web browser um, and it talks to all of the um, devices along the path that are enabled for, for doing this sort of tracing in order to create a trace file that then you could, would be in control of handing to somebody, right? Like you, you need to design this in a way where, um, you know, end user control of the metadata came first. And I think by not trying to hang that off of, of you know, the way we've done this in the past where you're unintentionally radiating stuff, you have the ability to do better than we've done in the past. Um, I'm, if I, if I knew how to do this in a way that would deploy, I'd be working on that right now. Um, but uh, I think it'd be really, really useful um, uh, to figure out what could be done incrementally in terms of sort of a research agenda and then invest in that. Okay, so I see Jana and Q, we have one more slide on this topic and times are marching as, as it does. So Jana, do you wanna go now or wait for Jared to, to talk about this other slide? And, and either way, let's try and wrap this topic in the next five, 10 minutes. Um, either one, you decide, you're the host. Okay, why don't we let Jared present, and I'm sure you'll have a comment on that. So, so Jared, you have a sure. slide. I'm, I'm happy to to talk to Jana at length about anything. So, uh, it, it, yeah. So, uh, uh, when Colin and I were discussing this the other day, I said, "Hey, well, here, here's why the ISPs need the DSCP marketing." Um, the, the big thing is, you know, uh, you know, uh, when I previously worked at a large service provider, we, we have business models, we have SLAs around performance, but be, obviously we can only control the performance on our own network. Um, you know, we can't control a third party, we can't control interconnect points, and, and that's why many companies end up building their own private networks. Um, and th there's advantages for this. Enterprise networks, they tend to pay more money than wholesale customers. You give them a higher SLA, uh, and you use a limited number of DSCP bits to, you know, generally provide like a, you know, a bronze, a silver, or a gold type solution, uh, you know, uh, for that. Um, you know, customers also tend to be very sticky on these services, uh, and 
they'll actually pay to extend my network uh, you know, to locations where they say, oh, well, I'm building a new office park here. You know, I already have, you know, either this MPLS service or, you know, or some other service from you. You know, I, I want to, uh, I want to extend networks. So not only do I get the benefit of my network being extended by these people, uh, I'm also tending to charge them a lot higher uh, revenue than uh, I would for just a wholesale IP connection. Uh, the other thing is when it comes to the technical implementation uh, on the routers, uh, once you configure any sort of rate shaping on the devices, generally uh, it will, uh, depending on the platforms, but many of them uh, by default will uh, stomp on all the DSCP bits. So you have to go in and do active configuration on all the ports on the devices, and you have to classify them really well. Uh, so you understand which ones are infrastructure links, which ones are customer links, which ones are somewhere in between, because sometimes you have things like that. And, and you know, uh, many customers, you know, at least on the wholesale side, that th they really want a liability limit. They may say, I'm going to connect to you with a 10 gig port so I can later come back and upgrade my contract. But I don't want to. I don't want to pay for more than two gigs of traffic. That way they can budget uh, accurately. Uh, and, and the other thing is that when it comes to these bit, you know, the bit usage, you know, there really is not, uh, you know, aside from a few of them, there's not really, you know, a consistent standard and there's no incentive for inter-provider, you know, QS or DSCP markings uh, to ensure that they, that, uh, they interoperate. And, and, and that I think is really, you know, really the big thing is that there's not there's not a market incentive for people. In fact, there's a disincentive to say, no, I, I want to have these people be sticky on my network such that I can control it uh, and, and provide that controlled experience uh, that customers is, is paying a premium for. So getting, getting those across network boundaries, very unlikely. And I, uh, I, I can call the queue if you want, Stephen. Shanna? Um, thanks for that, Jared. I, 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 I was just going to speak to something slightly different uh, from earlier. Um, but that's basically the point I was trying to make, uh, the point that I wanted to make is that we were talking about observability and being able to do these things um, uh, with with uh, traffic going through the networks. I, I was going to say that at a high level, I think we need to start thinking broadly about observability and tooling differently than we have in the past. I mean, we have traditionally thought, thought about tooling in particular ways with service providers, with, with operators, and there's always been contention between that and traffic in the network. And Brian already mentioned SpinBit, and here I am mentioning it for a second time. Um, so you truly ruined everybody's day now. Um, but but the the I think that the the... I do think that there's there's a real problem here uh, in terms of us being able to 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 see what's happening both at the end users in terms of what uh, the quality of experience is for end users ultimately, and what's happening in the network from from a uh, 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 from from a an application's point of view, for example. And I think that I would I would personally be more interested in talking about more explicit. Uh, uh, measurements on aggregates and various such things, making those kinds of things visible across ISP boundaries, instead of constantly trying to do this on a per flow basis. Because we don't actually, that information is perhaps useful at the endpoints, but pretty much nowhere else is that information, per flow information really that useful. Um, I, 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 like I said, I do think that this is an important problem to solve, but I think we need to walk away and try to walk away from individual flows. We've traditionally used individual flows because I believe that's where information has been available. Uh, service providers have used individual flows because they could look into TCP there, find out what really, what is happening to the connection, use that as a proxy for what's happening to the aggregate and so on and so forth. And I think tooling has to move away from that towards more explicit signaling oh, of network conditions, of network quality, of what's happening on the network. Uh, Robin, I think you're up. Oh. oh, hello, Jared. Can you hear me? Yeah, here you find. Okay, so I, I, I my question is here: is the DSAP, the ISP needed the DSAP? But I 
uh, have this the question is the DSCP code point is enough for the ISPs for the purpose of the marking the portable service? I, I, I think the reality of things like DSCP is that there's, uh, there's really insufficient bit space available for the, the levels of mappings that you might need. You might have an application that wants to say, you know, I, I'm, I'm willing to go into the junk queue and kind of be overflow. Um, you know, and service providers, if if there's a standard bit space that says, hey, I don't want to, you know, you know, I don't want my equipment to stomp on this. I want to be able to read that signal. And then whether or not I act on that signal on a, on a policy basis, you know, based upon the configuration, I, I think is, you know, is something that's feasible. I, like at Akamai, we have people internally who are saying, hey, I want to set DSCP on certain classes of traffic. And we say, well, we use some of these bits internally. I've got, I've got competing people who want to use that same limited bit space. I, I think this is something where, uh, you know, if we are going to build a fully differentiated internet where, uh, in the future, if we want to develop that type of an architecture where we can have application signal it, have end user signal it, and have network signal uh, these behaviors, we need a lot more bit space available uh, to be able to do that. You know, uh, and, and th that I think is is really kind of the crux of the situation is that there is such a limited space available. Okay. Uh, my second one is that the because of the DSCP, you also mentioned that you we must be carefully to classify the traffic to the different uh, DSCP. But also, I think the proposed challenge, uh, the uh, because you the DSCP is an uh, indirect way. So I think that's maybe uh, I I wonder if some of this the direct way such based on the uh, uh, destination IP address or this. Uh, can also be used because from my point of view, I, I mean, so that DSCP marking sometimes is not a, a direct. Yeah, and, and 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 I think you know there's some opportunity to do things, and and you see some of that in, uh, you know, so we have some people internally who've proposed the idea of using the DSCP bits to essentially say. I want to use the DSCP bit to pick a different forwarding table on the device um, as, as one of the, you know, as one of the solution spaces versus doing, you know, a full segment routing or other types of implementation, which might be, you know, or a label, you know, or a label based uh, lookup to identify which forwarding table uh, to use because not all the devices that are in the path may be, you know, either label aware or, uh, you know, we may not want to pay for the licensing or, or you know, or, you know, or whatever may come into play with that. You know, th this broadly comes down to an economic question. And in most cases for the service provider, uh, it is cheaper to add bandwidth than it is to uh, configure DSCP correctly. The problem okay. is no amount of adding bandwidth solves the basic problem that we have. And that's that's the part that people, I mean, you see that in the L4S work, you see that in Buffer Bill work. I, I mean, it, it, the problem is not lack of bandwidth necessarily, right? The problem is the the, implica the, the how that how things are queued in that bandwidth. And there are many, many ways to solve that cat too. I'm not saying this is the, the only way to skin that cat, but it's just, just you know. So I guess the queue seems to be me, Brian, Jana, and then Matt. Uh, and maybe we, we uh, tail off this topic a little and move on to the next one, Charlie. On, on the question of observability, uh, I mean, I, I think that this is certainly something worth looking at. It's something that can be quite hard. So the, the recent thing I've been looking at in this space has been around these kind of COVID tracing apps. And it turns out that you could, on the one hand, say this is a great victory for privacy by design because the, the, the actual protocol for doing this COVID tracing is pretty good. On the other hand, you could say this is pretty shit because at least the, in one implementation on Android, it's also implemented as part of Google Play services, which is actually not very good from a privacy point of view because it keeps calling home to Google in various ways. So I, it, it's unclear to me whether we can really tie this down at a protocol level or not. I think we could. It's certainly worth thinking about how, how, you, how you would make things more sensibly observable in a privacy-friendly way. I think mean, that's definitely worth looking at. 
I'm not sure how well we can kind of address that on a per protocol basis. And equally, I'm very skeptical that we could come up with some great overarching, here's how, here's how, what I let you observe about everything I do. So I, I don't know if it's a really an easily solvable problem at all. And that was me. So, and then we had uh, Brian and Jana and Matt. So on, on the observability point, I just want to I, I just want to go to to something that that Jared just said that I put in the notes and it kind of struck me right like we're talking about um, you know research into uh, sort of like distributed tracing privacy preserving distributed tracing for network performance right which I agree is a very hard problem um, I don't think it's an unsolvable problem because at least on the technical side of things we do our PC sampling let at large scales in many. Um, uh, environments which are not only single provider, single um, uh, single administrative domain, but we're talking about things that are going to be, you know, you know, fiddly and twitchy, and uh, uh, things that are fiddly and twitchy are also opportunities for um, network vendors to charge additional licensing fees. And the thing that, that Jared said to me is like, for the service provider, adding bandwidth is cheaper than turning DSCP on, right? Like DSCP is one bit. Right, we're talking about our one byte. We're talking about it's, it's six bits, but it usually gets it is eight bits, which is why ECN doesn't work. Um, like, and if we if we can't like you know figure out how we're going to economically turn you know six bits of signaling on, more than six bits of signaling is going to be harder to deploy as well. Um, I still think it's worth. So what you said, Stephen, about like this not being necessarily the protocol issue, I think it, it, it probably isn't a protocol issue. And, and probably we even the IETF in this discussion focus too much about uh, too much on which bits do we put on and a little bit less on the what is the, the interaction model, right? Like, so who's in control of when something gets measured and who's in control of how that data flows? And I think stepping back from the protocol a little bit and, and, and working on that problem might be a way to to um uh, break that particular log jam, but, but keep in mind that like if you know if we can say that adding bandwidth is cheaper than turning DSCP on for a service provider, then maybe we should just invest in adding bandwidth. Okay, I think I have uh, Janet and then Matt in the queue, and I'm suggesting that after that we move on to the next topic, unless somebody uh -huh. else about it. Yeah, uh, yeah, I just want to comment back to to Brian yeah. real quick and, and say that I, I can buy like a 32 by 400 gig box for for less than 10 grand. And so for adding the band, like adding the bandwidth, like if I'm going to pay a software license for MPLS, it's probably going to be a quick cost. And I'm going to pay that per device. Uh, Jana? Um, thanks, Stephen. So I, 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 I agree with what Brian said. I, I, I think that this is definitely not a protocol issue, in my opinion. And I think in terms of just the protocol issue, I, I actually, on this particular point, I'll say I, I agree with Jared's slide here. Um, this is, I think the, the, the ship has sailed on, on using DSCP for anything but what it's being used for. But that's my personal opinion. It, it doesn't hold that much. It's it's used extensively within, within ISPs, and it's used extensively for um, reasons that hardware does. Hardware does what you want to do with DSCP, and you can define these code points to mean whatever you want them to mean, and hardware will do it for you at line speed, and that's really useful, and it gets used all over the place because of that. Um, so using it as an end-to-end -end signal of, of, some, of something is, is a very, very long shot. Um, but on the other hand, if we move away from the protocol itself, and we ask the question of, we step back and ask the questions that may have very different answers than what they did 20, 30 years ago. Uh, we could ask the questions of what is important to observe? What do we want to signal end to end? What do we want to agree on end to end and so on? And those could be explicit. And like I said earlier, they need not be at the flow level. Um, I, I, I think there's a question of mechanism here, but we do need to talk about what it is that we want to communicate across the network and which entities ought to be able to see that. Protocol and signaling is a separate matter, but uh, I don't think we have agreement on that first question. Uh, Matt? Find the unmute button. Um, I, I wanted to second this in a different way. There's a there's another sort of fundamental reason why bandwidth is cheaper than control. I'll put it that way. And that is during non-crisis time, not having enough bandwidth 
means that you end up having to arbitrate which of your customers can watch high definition video. If, if everybody wants to watch high definition video, if you want to support that, then you have to have enough headroom where all other QoS problems are easy for, for most users. Um, I, I would be surprised if DSCP actually has much effect during non-crisis times in ISPs. I, I don't have any data on that, just because bandwidth is cheaper than, than control. In crisis, and, excuse me, and then the other thing that people want to have is, is controlling the last mile because of, of low delay applications and the large queues being at the last mile. So it makes, it makes sense there in the default sort of environment. In crisis environment, it's a very different problem, and that's what, what we hit in COVID um, situation, the COVID COVID bump, and there it's, um, you really do need trained bandwidth. And at that point, we're not under using QS in the sense we, since we're not using the signaling or haven't been using the signaling, we're not appropriately configured to do the right thing with it. And manual traffic management telling people you have to get off now is always a fallback for the home users. I would ask just one, one question clarifying about what you said there. Could, could you say what you think is different between the sort of crisis time and the non-crisis time about about any of the apps running over the network? Because I'm not um, seeing it. If it's, a, if it's not a crisis time, as a, as a business concern for access to ISPs, they want all their customers to be able to support s streaming video, it's, and, you know, whatever their economic reality is, but some large fraction of their users to support video. And that, that load is so much larger than everything else. The aggregate of that load is so much larger than everything else that everything sort of fits in underneath it, right? It, and and uh, I, I don't. I, okay, we could talk about offline, but I, I do not think that's true. If you it, whether it's well, pre-COVID or non-COVID, running video in a Zoom call and a YouTube call at the same time always compete with each other. And they both can drive the video bandwidth beyond whatever bandwidth you have available, no matter what bandwidth you have available across, you know, broadly available. They will both deliver services at a higher bandwidth than that. Right. Per, per, but they need to arbitrate. They need to arbitrate between sim, two similar. Which services. they do a great job of doing, of scaling right. such the right. service right. so they do that. But I don't understand how that's different during COVID times and non-COVID times. Uh, the issue is. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the high pressure on smaller services, things like um, file sharing, document sharing, uh, mail, and such like that, which are perhaps more economically important. Web transactions for doing purchasing, ordering, and stuff like that, which um, is all relatively low bandwidth and actually not latency sensitive. Um, making video calls work well under crisis does require a good QS service. Okay, I, I'm going to suggest we kind of move on because I suspect some of the same discussion will come up under security or anything else anyway. So, um, uh, and so the next topic people I think wanted to talk about was kind of generic sort of security effects. And, and I think there's kind of two directions here. One is like what kind of new threats or changes in threats did we see? during the course of the pandemic. And I guess the other kind of direction is uh, what kind of security tools did we have that we started using more during the pandemic and so on. I don't think I have any anybody sent me explicit slides on this, um, unless Dominique's one is intended for this bullet, I wasn't clear. Um, so what I was just going to do is Kirsty, is Kirsty on the call today, I guess so, or not, I haven't looked. Um, Kirsty. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I was just going to pop up the mail you sent if, um, and maybe use that just to kind of kick off some discussion, if that's okay with you? Yeah, that's me, thanks. Um, I'm, not, is that, I'm not sure, I have no idea how visible that is to people, but uh, you could have got the mail last night anyway. That was quite legible, Stephen. Good, okay, so quite legible or illegible? Sorry, legible. Oh, good. <laughs> Nice surprise. Um, so why don't we let Kirsty talk to that mail, and maybe that will just kind of lead us into the discussion. Uh, and Dominique's slides are for the next topic. That's fine. So Kirsty, you want to chat about this? Um, yeah, sure. I guess this is because uh, on Wednesday I raised kind of the security posture that we we were seeing during um, the COVID 
stuff really so since March really for the NTSC we just published our annual review and it's been a kind of year of two halves where we have the before March kind of normal business as usual and then the post March um, where the NTSC's workbook looked very different so some of the stuff you might be aware of like the COVID apps and all that kind of stuff but what um, I'm really focusing on here is the shift in attacks that we saw so what's quite difficult, I suppose, in conjunction to a lot of the stuff we've already seen, where there's a lot of um, graphs and nice measurements, and you can see a real uptick in traffic volumes and stuff. What we see instead is maybe not an uptick in total attacks, but a shift in the lures being used and the attacker behavior and a shift in targets. So I think it's going to be quite hard to look at kind of numbers to really get across what we saw as an impact um, so the impact here is not necessarily an overall increase in um, in certain things. It's just more a pivot from attackers. So I can describe um, a bit of this this uh, email. Um, it's just taken from our annual reviews. It's very high level, just in stats. Um, but we have this takedown service where if we see a malicious ill, then we um, we can contact the the service and get them to take down, uh, usually the URL taken down because of copyright actually from using a government logo, which is quite amusing. Um, but they are, they're taken down for various reasons. And so you can see some stats here in terms of this latest year, uh, how many were taken down across the whole year. So 1, 000, uh, sorry, 166,710 phishing URLs that were discovered were taken down. And of course, these are just ones that have been discovered. So I don't know how many there are in total, um, but these are the ones we discovered and were taken down. You can see what proportion were associated with uh, UK government themed attacks. And then there's just a nice bit that our global share reduced. So that's a nice success story for us. Um, but then since March, we have a focus on what uh, the coronavirus themes that began to be used. And this is kind of relating, I suppose, to my position paper a bit that in terms of a pandemic situation, like we haven't studied, I think is an interesting question. If in a pandemic situation you're isolated, you might be spending a lot more time online than you would be before, and so your tolerance to phishing might decrease. You might be more um, keen for news. You might be feeling a bit more vulnerable. Um, you might just be a bit more susceptible in general to phishing. So there's a socio-technical element to that that we haven't researched fully. Um, but whatever, for whatever reason, coronavirus themes began to be used. And you can see the split there in terms of what they were associated with. Um, selling bogus PPE, like preying on people's fears to sell vaccines and stuff. Um, some were just using that as a hook to get money, um, quite a lot of them. Some were just to distribute malware. Um, and so what, what can we say about this? So Stephen, I thought you came back with a request for how this compared to last year. And uh, sorry, I've been uh, quite busy today, so I haven't fully found this. But um, I guess what I did find our annual review from the previous year. And so in the previous year, we actually took down 177,000 phishing URLs, which was uh, roughly 23,000 attacks per group. And so what, what can you deduce from that? Actually, maybe we just got worse at detecting phishing. Um, you'd like to think year on year we're getting better. So in theory, the number of phishing URLs discovered should increase, perhaps. Um, it's very hard to quantify that. Um, or if it at least stays static, we can say, OK, why did we have a reduction in this? It might be because um, different access sectors other than phishing um, were found, like there might have been a better way to gain access. One specific example is um, the increase in uh, VPN vulnerability exploitation. So we saw an increase in scanning for those vulnerabilities. And that you could hypothesize is because there's um, more chance that a target you're interested in is using a VPN service, right? Like if it's being more commonly used. Again, it's, it's quite hard to definitively point to that and to measure it, but um, we can just in a qualitative way, we can say that we've seen attacks where that has been the initial foothold, whereas in other campaigns, perhaps it would be more of a phishing email. So, um, yeah, the, the numbers themselves are just kind of illustrative, I suppose. We have a lot of experience and, um, yeah, we've had a lot of incidents that we've managed that have dealt with COVID as the lure, as the theme. And so I suppose it's just kind of what, what's really interesting, I suppose, is that pre-March, basically, there were no campaigns using this at all. And then post-March, we saw a rapid increase in, like, domain registrations for coronavirus-related names. Some of those are legitimate, but quite a lot were not. And so I guess it's just kind of what we haven't really seen before is this sudden, from zero to a lot, 
of attacks using a certain lure. So people are quite used to the tax office getting in touch saying you've got tax rebates. But were they, in terms of our four layers of fishing um, prevention and stopping that attack being successful, le uh, like educating users is only one of those layers. And that layer might have been less effective. And so I guess one of my open questions that I think got posted around is like, given that, given that users might be less effective in a phishing uh, layer defense, do we have to do something on the other three layers? And this relates kind of to the NCFC launch launching the vulnerability and suspicious email reporting service so that you are able to kind of increase yeah, increase that layer of defense. But it's just it's just a question that's still quite a manual intervention. So um I, I guess that's kind of all I have to say about that email. Um I can send some follow up stats. But like I said, I feel like comparing absolute numbers is not is not telling the full story because there is a, a narrative in terms of per incidents. Um there are some advisories that describe this as well. But like for various incidents, the uh, initial attack vector is, is different. The lure used is different. Even the target set is different. So we're seeing sectors that haven't been targeted before now being targeted because um, what they have in a pandemic situation is perceived to be more valuable. So yeah, that's kind of all for me. Thanks, Stephen, for the opportunity thanks to talk this through. Yeah, I guess, uh, and, and thanks for kind of having a look back at last year's numbers. And, and I, yeah, I think you're right. You can't, they're not as easily comparable as kind of bit rates from year to year. Um, I, I think one thing I take away from this is that probably in terms of measuring security and so on, there's, there's work to be done in figuring out how, what things to measure and, and how to do it. Because I mean, you see the kind of annual reporting from like the likes of yourselves or from some security vendors that produce these interesting reports every year. But they're they're you know they're not commensurate with each other. They're not even necessarily commensurate from year to year, um, with the same kind of uh, source. So I think there's there's probably some how do we measure interesting security things work to be done. The second thing I, I, I was wondering about, and I don't know the answer here either, is all everybody going working from home presumably does create some new kind of it changes the kind of risk in, in various ways. Um, some obvious ways it might create more risk or more likelihood of of an attack succeeding. And I think you called it a couple of those. It might also have the opposite impact too, because we may have been moving from a place where a lot of people were doing like a little bit of work at home or using the using some really unmanaged five year old laptop that's still running a, a bad version of an operating system. And then they moved to actually having a little bit of help from their sysadmins or being given a, a a laptop to bring home, which I think happened in a lot of cases. And that might actually have improved security for them and decreased decreased risk. But we don't know. So. Yeah, I, I guess my main thing on, on this topic is that it will be great to, to, to figure out how to measure things a bit better, because uh, I, I, I'm not sure I've seen good discussion of, of the effect of the pandemic. Now, maybe it also it might happen, maybe there's a whole bunch of papers going to be at NDSS next next January, February, whatever, and then it will have been done, but I haven't seen it so far, at least. Uh, I think I have Maria in the queue, and I don't know if anybody else is wants to be in the queue, but if you do, type post queue in the WebEx chat. Maria? Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for sharing this data. That's actually interesting. Um, I do have a question more on your other a little bit, um, because um, you said that we should think about protocol work to to address vulnerabilities in, in the remote infrastructure, remote working infrastructure. But um, this is kind of, it's still very a little bit high level for me because the remote inf infrastructure is not like the one infrastructure everybody uses, it, right? It's like different components, it's conferencing tools, it's VPNs and so on. Um, so um, I, I think I don't have a good understanding if there's anything special about this infrastructure that we didn't consider yet, or it's just like a bunch of applications that we've been talking about. Um, and then the other point is also that I think a lot of the problems we've seen and including the one about Zoom, for example, that you mentioned as an example, is really people not applying our protocols correctly or not like developing an application in a secure way, even so I think like certain security standards are well known. So it's really an educational problem rather than a protocol problem. Um, and so like, currently we're discussing this at a very high level. We need to do something because there obviously is a problem, but it's not clear who should be doing it at which layer and, and you know, what exactly. So we need a much deeper dive in there. Or do you have further thoughts or insights? Can I come back on um, your point and also Stephen's? 
before. Um, so yeah, so the question I'm asking is, I mean, it's not it's not presupposing anything can be done, actually. Like, we might take an honest look at this and say, actually, we've done everything we could do from the protocol side of things, and yeah, the solutions lie elsewhere. Um, the question, it's a question to be asked, like, what could be done? So I guess, like, fishing is a very uh, easy example where we, we know we have four layers, and helping users and educating them is only one of those layers, right? And so we can do what we can do in that layer. Um, and we've done a lot of um, socio-technical research on what lands best there. But the other layers in terms of like making it harder for attackers to reach your users from, in the first place, like is there something that can be done there? Um, is it just encouraging uptake of existing protocols that are already out there? I think it's just a question and, and it's not presupposing anything can be done. Right, it's just like a, a question for me when we think about the network impact. Um, yeah, so I mean, for infrastructure, you're right, like it's a range of stuff. I think for me, I'm specifically thinking about people using new technologies and not knowing how well that's being done, like not having a good appreciation. And that's partly because of a shift in user demographic, like people were spending more time online, but also people who would barely spend any time online before were now spending a lot more time online because that was their main way of getting groceries delivered, that was a way of keeping in touch with their families. And so from a citizen point of view, that's kind of our focus and that's, that's what we're thinking about. Um, and then you have, obviously, from an enterprise point of view, uh, like Stephen said, people being given a laptop and told to go home. And for some uh, companies, that may have improved their security posture. Um, but I think where we have seen incidents has been, obviously, where that hasn't worked well. And so uh, a poor rollout of infrastructure or a rushed, I mean, in fairness, it's not, it's not poor, it's just time I'm constrained and uh, it's difficult when you have a large fleet to manage um, where we've seen that been done poorly or outdated um, yeah, software being used and so vulnerabilities exist that are being exploited. That's the kind of stuff we talk about. I guess it's, it is unfortunate because for security, unless you're in the industry um, and there are some people on this call, I think, who are kind of experts in this field um, and you are actually managing incidents then we're not going to make exact details of an exact attack public. It's, it's very difficult to anonymize it. And obviously we care a lot about the privacy of people and organizations and reputational risk and stuff. So, um, but what we can say is that, you know, as a group of incidents, as a collection that we manage, we have seen increases um, that we ascribe due to the shift into home working and the rise in VPNs and the rise in um, like these kind of vulnerability, uh, like, sorry, rise in users who are being more vulnerable, who are spending longer online and have more access to these kind of security scams than perhaps previously. And so, yeah, the, the open question really is just, we've done so far a manual intervention, the suspicious email reporting service, like could other stuff be done? And that's really, that is just a question, not presupposing the answer in any way. Okay, I think the queue has Lixia. <clears throat> Let me just make a few simple points. The first one is, how do we view this QVID? QVID? Is this just a, a network connectivity challenge? Then we measure ourselves whether we succeeded or not solving this one problem at this time. Uh, I think a different view of the QVID is actually, this is kind of an amplifier that amplified or exposed um, more widely the already existing problems in the internet. I think security is one such area uh, because COVID amplified the role of the internet in the society, forced many people who previously didn't uh, depend on the internet to do their business, but now they do. So let's not think about, oh, we handled bandwidth well, so we succeeded in QI. I mentioned, I think I added into the uh, Etherpad notes that handling the backbone internet or whatever, anything beyond last mile, that's where we spend years of years. So we know how to handle those stuff. It is the connectivity to the residency area. That's where not much attention has been paid. And we fall short 
in tools, in understanding, and in solutions. But I want to go back about the security. Sorry for taking so long. Uh, education for security has been there for as long as I can remember. The question we need to ask ourselves is how effective it has been. If one can learn from the past, you can project in the future how effective it can be. The, uh, the, another thing is about the IETF that uh, we've been spent so much efforts on security. There's a, a number of um, working groups develop the solutions. You know, DSSEC is, is the first one I got involved a bit. Then there is a BGP security. Then there's a DKIM. Then there's other things. My, my pro memory cannot remember much. The question is, how much effort have we put in and how, how effective they have been? This relates to yet another question. Um, how do we handle security? Is the security by layers and each layer will do their own thing independent from others? Is the security by applications? Every application take care of themselves. I'm, I'm not suggesting solution one way or the other, but I think whichever way the IP believes, let's write it down and see if the community agrees and open that discussion. I just so far haven't seen any clear documentation. What is our kind of a basic approach to address the security challenges? I can be pessimistic, I really do, but I, I don't think security is getting better. I think it's getting way worse compared to even just 10 years ago, despite all our effort. And so, why so, is so? So Nishan, I'm, I'm not clear what you mean there. Can you give me an example of, of what's worse now than 10 years ago? Because I, I don't know if I would just of... say, I say, it's a very simple thing, DDoS. I think the threat of DDoS is getting bigger. Look at the, the, uh, the magnitude. They grow a lot faster than actually the bandwidth, the raw bandwidth grows in terms of percentage. In terms of a scale, in 2010, we didn't have any scale of DDoS like the Mariah attack had. So, sorry. Yeah, I, and I... in terms of in terms of uh, the fake news today, we, I don't remember we had anything similar back ten years. You might think that's is way beyond IETF coverage. Yes, but the who's? I mean, it, it's a security piecemeal solution. We take care of our own piece, or there is something much bigger picture. We have to take an overview. The, so I would, I would just um, end up here. I think that uh, how we handle security, I think we need to take a broader view than just uh, develop a specific solution like DKIM and focus on that one. If I'm saying DKIM as an example, there's an, all the so security solutions so far, to me, is a piecemeal. I'm done. Okay, I think we had DKG and Yari in the queue. Uh, hi there. Uh, so, Kirsty, I wanted to thank you for calling out the, the range of different kinds of security issues that um, and, and, and uh, reliability issues that come up um, with the, your, the messages that you sent to the list um, with COVID. And it, it occurs to me from um, thinking about what you've written that we're really in a scenario that is sort of like the September that never ended, right? Like when the, when the web you know, suddenly became something that the general public used. There was this huge influx of new users, um, and there were a lot of a lot of things that had worked for folks who were comfortable sort of um, digitally before. It became obvious that they were sort of falling apart. And I think maybe w one of the things that you're pointing to um, is that uh, is is that as as we had a, a sudden influx of people who didn't, who weren't used to living online, who suddenly became used to living online, those folks became vulnerable to all the things that um, maybe, I don't know, digital natives were more used to working around or, or you know, detecting as, as bogus, talking about phishing or spam, or whatever. Um, uh, you know, a huge part of that has nothing to do with protocols. It has to do with user interface um, and user expectations and how we manage and set those things. And I know that the IETF doesn't do 
uh, stuff at that layer. Um, but we do things that, that provide inputs to those layers um, and could provide guidance that, um, like, how pre be done without saying, you know, you have to show this many pixels of warning or whatever. Um, but I, but I, but it seems to me like what what you're talking about is that we really need to do more to think about um, what kinds of indicators we pr our tools can present to users so that they can help to distinguish between, say, a phishing attack and a, a regular email from their boss. Um, so I, anyway, I just I, it, it seems to me like there's a there's a question about not only user interface research, but protocol level research about what indicators do we think. Um, the user interface people need to be able to expose effectively um, or, or how to make them actionable. And I, you know, I would be interested in seeing that kind of work done. I think we have a responsibility at the IETF to think more about those questions than we have in the past. Okay, I think we have Yari and then Jana in the queue. Uh, and we probably also want to take a break shortly. So let's aim to take a break in, like let's say, at before 10 past the hour and take five minutes and then come back. So let's go ahead for now. Yeah, just very briefly, I think, uh, first of all, like you know, we are I guess, discussing an area which is not necessarily exactly in the scope of, of this workshop, but there are obviously lots of problems in the internet and you know, security as, as a broad category is, is, is maybe the wor worst of those problems. And we need to address that and, uh, and you know, lots of work is so ongoing to to make improvements there, and maybe more work should happen. Or I believe at least that more more work should happen. Um, but I, I I guess just commenting quickly on on Alicia, what what you were saying, I, I think there's uh, we could have a debate about like you know uh, is the situation now better or worse? We have made also a lot of improvements, and situation is in some ways better, but there's also we can. Probably also everybody on, on this call can agree that there are huge problems left and uh, and we should uh, do something about those. I think uh, where we might actually disagree a little bit uh, is is how we go about that. So I, I actually do believe what you said about this holistic approach that we should look at the thing as a whole. Um, I do not, however, believe that like there's like you know one tool or one solution that solves uh, these different issues because they're, it, it's, it's like a very different problem to protect communications, for instance, uh, compared to protecting data or being worried about the you know, influence of some parties who have access to more data than some, some others do. Um, so I think um, we'll probably have uh, many different things and, and uh, there are ongoing efforts <laughs> to deal with some of those and we should have uh, more efforts uh, targeted towards this, um, but I, you know, if, if you look at some of the some proposals for, you know, let's fix this internet security problem, you often find that uh, it, it's it, they are, you know, even if they claim that this is like the holistic approach, um, they actually turn out to be a very narrow solution, and in fact, they often have also some some major problems in their design. So. Let's not jump too too easily to those uh, sort of simple one solution fits all all these answers. That's all I want to say. Jana, and then maybe let's take that break when we get to ten past, or, or when Jana's done. I'm stopping everybody from going to the bathroom. That's not a good place to be. Sorry. Um, I'll I'll my uh, I'll make a quick comment. At a high level, I think that uh, Lisa's point is definitely something that we can, it resonates with with many of us. I think that security cannot be piecemeal. That we have to do a high level. Uh, we have to do a consolidated solution. It has to be uh, one piece, not piecemeal. At the same time, we are we are we have two other issues which always always in my mind dominate some of these conversations. One of them is incentive and control. We might have incentive but we don't have control. Um, each one of us here controls small pieces, unfortunately, which is partly why you end up with this piecemeal solution, because a person who's deploying something ends up wanting to deploy something that they can secure. Uh, and and organizations like the IAB or the IETF are places where we can have these conversations and other vendors come together, but we still have to incentivize each one of those 
uh, um, uh, entities to deploy such a thing. That's at the simplest level, encrypting at the protocol has so much tension between operators and endpoints. It's hard to imagine uh, doing much more than that uh, because practically there are limitations to how this 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 unfortunately unfolds. I'd say that uh, uh, on, on, on the second side, I'd say also that there's there's part of the blame here lies unfortunately with you, Leisha, for building an internet that is fundamentally insecure. I mean, we have we we don't have these these. Uh, 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 basic hooks that that we would now if we were to build a network now we would not build it uh, with with, uh, uh, with with without some nominal notion of uh, security hooks and things like that but um, the network is what it is and and um, i think as a result bringing something piecemeal is is what we end up having as a result of that um, and, and finally, one last point on, on yes, it would be amazing to be able to include. So, so uh, when you're building something piecemeal, you are trying to define the attack very precisely and trying to protect against very precise attacks that you can cover, you can limit against, and you, you build for those attacks. Uh, if we think of fake news as an attack, it walks into another territory, which again, the uh, protocol developers and others have shied away from, which is values, values and uh, uh, trying to arbitrate what is uh, good and what is not. Uh, I'd love to have a conversation, but I just feel like this is not a conversation that I've successfully had in in, in technical communities. Um, and I also feel that if if we can't, it'd be interesting for me to see if we can't solve this uh, with humans in the loop, how we might solve this with just machines. Um, it's a tough problem. I don't know how we would go about solving it. Well, to jump in, uh, but, uh, it's, if we don't solve it, who's going to solve it? Or we just let it grow? But people should take a break. Okay, so let's uh, let's take that break. So are people able to come back in five minutes or you need 10? I'm going to assume five in a little bit. Works. Right? No, what's up? Oh, no. Nick, meet yourself. Where's she going? Uh-oh. Mm.
Okay, so it's quarter past now. Um, I, I guess we run for another 45 minutes. Um, and we want to try and do that. So I put in some, uh, we have these topics left. I put in some rough timings, about 10 minutes each, five minutes, to try and wrap up with some actions, five minutes to take feedback. And that's not a huge amount of time, but uh, we don't have much more than that. So uh, I think we have one slide on this topic here from Dominique, um, which I guess I'll pop up. Any other, and then, so again, we want to do this pretty quickly. Um, the slide has some nice kind of juicy topics that would uh, easily <laughs> Of all of the 45 minutes so yeah sorry about that Stephen. um but there's been discussion on consolidation on um arch <laughs> really good too um yeah so uh andrew and i put in sort of a a, a paper that's a bit left field and we just wanted to kind of stir up some discussion um and actually one thing i did want to say is one of the positive effects i think of covid um because we were talking about both security and positive effects has been Connectivity, more people getting online. So um, that's been really cool to see. Uh, yeah, so the internet's been resilient and we had some great presentations and uh, what's gonna happen in the future. Um, we uh, listed a couple trends, which um, we can discuss further, but just basically trends around the uh, protocol development that that um, obviously, as someone said in the chat, that kind of limits the, the ability to, to look at um, data and traffic, but also kind of siphons that data towards um, endpoints a bit more. Um, but also I threw in uh, digital sovereignty, um, you know, and, and a nationalistic internets, like inter internets or networks um, that are, are very much becoming sort of just, you know, within each country. Um, and that's a trend that's social and political as much as um, anything else. Um, we gave an example on VPNs. Um, one of the interesting things, and um, Andrew can talk about it really quickly, is looking at, we talked a lot about VPN use and, and the positive effects of it as well. But again, there's it's also a, cho a choke point. Um, and all of this sort of bigger discussion that we're having, um, and I think that Yari kicked off a couple of years ago on consolidation on the different layers of the internet, but also um, politics as well, politically as well. Um, of suggestions about what to do. Obviously, security and privacy needs to be ensured. And to Stephen's point earlier, he was saying, you know, it's not bad. And, and obviously, there needs to be a privacy aspect to it as well. But just being um, a little more aware of, of sort of how consolidation is sort of becoming a bigger issue um, involving more stakeholders. myself to do some security more security research but also in this area as well thinking more critically um and much more in depth than this paper on um consolidation so that's my quick presentation was that quick enough that was nice and quick yes thank you um okay so i guess the the, the i guess what we want to do is you know what did we forget or or what might we want to revisit um we obviously talked a lot about observability and so on um So uh, the question here is, what did we forget? And yeah, it looks pretty horrible. So what topics did we not cover that uh, would have been covered? What topics that were mentioned briefly that are kind of maybe not Outstanding, the huge in the notes would need to be more covered. And if the answer is nothing, then that's pretty good. Andrew. Hi, Steve. So, yeah, it seemed rude to leave it with nothing. Um, so uh, one one which we sort of touched on briefly, uh, but maybe didn't dwell on, is um, you you rightly you flagged that you know that there are some positive benefits from end to end encryption. Um, I'd question whether privacy is one of them. I think people conflate privacy and encryption uh, wrongly, but anyway, that's a different subject. Um, what I think is maybe not being given a great deal of thought so far is the negative effects of encryption. And for example, since Kirsty was talking about uh, some of the uh, security, cybersecurity issues, the more signals you hide, 
the user is for malware to flourish. Um, and certainly uh, the, the paper that Dominic referred to just now, I think our contention would be if COVID happened in five years time, given current trends, it, I, I personally would question whether the internet will be anything like as resilient as it has been now. So I think the negative effects of uh, some of the current sort of trends and developments from the ITF um, need to be considered in the light of um, how they might impair resilience uh, over the long term, because uh, I'm quite worried about that. Sure. Uh, I, I, I honestly don't understand if, how that can be considered to be something that's been forgotten, given the huge amounts of discussion we've had about it in the last number of years. Um, well, we well, we haven't really discussed, uh, we've touched on the encryption, but we haven't discussed the, the, the unintended negative effects of it in the context of resilience. I don't think we've, we've really discussed that in the last two and a bit sessions, two and a half sessions. Okay, uh, so I think we have Yari, Jared, and that's the queue for now. Yeah, so um, I was actually going to maybe talk about um, Two forgotten things, and and one is may, may, maybe what what uh, Andrew just mentioned, but uh, from a slightly different angle. So I think resilience in general we haven't really talked so much about. Like I, I'd, I'd be interested in understanding like uh, infrastructure resilience and, and and so on. Maybe that's related to what Andrew was talking about, or maybe not. But I you know I don't think we need to go to the <laughs> encryption debate uh, right now. Um, it may also be related to Dominic's point about consolidation. Um, so that's one thing that I, I think we we perhaps should have explored a bit more in depth. Uh, at least I remember <laughs> mostly the CP discussion right now. Um, and uh, and the other thing is that we always think of like you know repeats of the same situation when we think about COVID. So another pandemic exactly like this, but I don't think that's realistic. I think we should expect that there'd be something unexpected. That's um, you know, a different event, uh, you know, uh, a part of a continent sinks down or <laughs> I hope not, but, uh, um, or, or maybe a security attack of some, some, some type, uh, that does attack, um, or, or something else. And I, I think it would be important to, to try and not, not put us, you know, too much focused on like this particular thing that we can respond to. You know the the uh, WebEx versus other traffic uh, prioritization issue, and um, the, the real problem that we might have five years from now is, is is potentially quite different. So let's think about that. Uh, I think we have Jared. Yeah. Then... Yeah. 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 I'll just jump in here and say I. I think actually the pandemic has shown us something very important, which is that the internet actually worked really well in this situation. Uh, in, in a collaborative multi-stakeholder environment, you know, insert other marketing terms here, uh, everybody seemed to work really well together during these times. The service providers upgraded links, uh, application uh, people went and turned you know, turn the dials to, uh, you know, make more bandwidth available. Uh, and because we had this global network available, uh, uh, many people were able to continue to, to function, continue to work. So, you know, there was not as much of a, uh, you know, th there was a, definitely a global economic impact, but it wasn't as bad as it would have been if we did not have these collaboration tools, these technologies and things available. So I, I want us to not lose sight of that, that, you know, despite all of the horrible things that, we, that we've lived through this year, there's really some amazing outcomes from this in that, you know, my children are doing school virtually. That's working not as ideal as I would, I as a parent would like, but it is working. Um, and yeah, we, we still have these issues with, you know, the tug between encryption and privacy and, you know, and, and, you know, and all that, and you know, app, you know, the application uniformity that you know that uh, seems to be coming out of the IETF. But I think when we're talking about the the impact, if we didn't have this network, how how much worse off would we have been? And and that is something that I think we should at least think about for a moment. 
So I think Brian is next in the queue, and then a few more people that I'll try and catch up on that in a minute. Brian? So um, I, I want to rip off what Jared said. Um, uh, everything Jared said, yeah. In, in SRE, we uh, generally, when we look at sort of like a big event, like an outage or something that was a near miss, we we, we um, write a postmortem, and in that postmortem, we have three sections: uh, what went poorly, what went well, and where we got lucky. And I've thought a lot about like so, uh, you know, the fact that the multi collaborative multi stakeholder environment worked well. I, I'm I've thought a lot about whether that's a what worked well and where we got lucky, and I think it's a little bit of both. I think that the fact that it's a network of networks, like the very underlying architecture, that there's not sort of like a, um, I mean, think for a moment if we were in a situation in the United States, or I should say you were in a situation in the United States where um, capacity upgrades needed to be done by uh, directly by the National Telecommunications Infrastructure Authority, um, like where that was a federal response, given the rest of the federal response to this pandemic, I think having a multi-stakeholder, multi-operator network um, was superior to that to that um, to that architecture. Um, on the consolidation point, though, I think that's a where we got lucky, right? Like so, um, like Jared said, you know, the you know everyone was working very hard together. That was it was. Um, I, I know uh, we were working very hard, um, <clears throat> and you know we're all you know, our incentives are aligned, right? Like we all want our services to work well. So we have to do our part of that service working well. But in a um, a more consolidated environment, it would only take one of the hyperscalers having done poorly, right? Like, so something having gone wrong in one of the application uh, areas to have had a, a seriously negative impact. Um, so uh, like the, the decentralization of it and the multi-stakeholderism of it, I think, was was a definite win. But I think that that it was a little riskier than it needed to be because of the consolidation uh, aspect of this. So I think we have a we have a building queue. We don't have that much time. I'm going to suggest that we basically lump in all these three topics uh, all at once. So if you want to talk to any of them, jump into the queue now. Um, and then in, let's say, another 10 minutes, Yari has a couple of wrap-up slides for the whole thing. And then I'd like to kind of just have some kind of feedback on the event format as well. So let's keep some time for that. So we have a half hour left. Let's take 10 minutes, uh, try and take 10 minutes more for this topic, where the queue is Kirsty, Larry, Colin, Maria, Jana, Oliver. So Kirsty. Thank you, Stephen. I hear the need to be brief, and that, that works for me. Um, so I just want to talk about like stuff we miss. I think where, however we write up and whatever we collate, we should just be really clear on what we mean when we say the internet worked well. Like it's certainly true that people could stay connected and it's certainly true that like we managed capacity well and, you know, but just um, as I've already alluded to, different users have different needs and um, it working well, like for me, that would have been not a single scam. Like we, we could have taken them all down immediately, right? So there are gaps for me from a security point of view. And I think it's just the stakeholders we have on the call are, you know, like rightly ISPs and measurement focused and stuff. But I think we should just be kind of clear on what we mean by that. Um, from the security point of view, at least, we've, we've had a good discussion today. And I think that's been very valuable that that has been a, a key topic in, in the workshop, um, as well as the resilience and the traffic volume and management of that. So, yeah, thank you. Being brief. Thanks. Brevity, welcome. So, uh, Larry? Echo the same point. The internet worked well for the people who had access to it, sufficient access for them to get their work done and for the kids to get their own work done. And then for everyone else, it worked terribly. So that's all I wanted to say. Colin? Yeah, um, so, so just on a couple of points. Um, I mean, on the, the the issue of unintended effects of better security. Um, I mean, I, I agree that the the issues of security have been discussed uh, massively, um, but um, it, certainly anything other than encrypt all the things gets pushed back uh, and pretty strong pushback in the ITF, uh, and that's fine. Um, but th there are perhaps nuanced reasons to not quite encrypt everything, um, w which are, are getting lost, and, and we have quite a one sided debate there. 
Um, in terms of uh, general resilience, uh, we, we spend a lot of time when we're talking about improving the internet architecture, discussing performance. Um, and we spend a lot of time discussing alternative architectures, which improve performance for certain types of applications or improve quality of service for certain types of applications. Um, we don't really discuss internet architecture in terms of uh, how it affects resilience of the network. Uh, and I, I worry that we're getting increasingly complicated, uh, increasingly performance architectures, which are getting so close to using all the, the capacity, all the features that we, we have nothing left for, for resilience and robustness at the end. Uh, and we, we maybe need to uh, focus more on that and, and more on um, you know, what, what happens when things are not working well. When we're, when we're evolving the network. Thanks. So I think the key is Maria, Jan, Oliver, and actually on the resilience, it's interesting that we, the IAB tried to create a mailing list for that topic around a year ago, and there was a bunch of initial discussion and then nobody wanted to do anything. <laughs> uh, and it just kind of wasted away. And so I think the queue is Maria, Jana, and Oliver. So uh, one point we didn't talk a lot, lot about, and maybe we don't have the right people, is the the economical impacts or changes um, that we've seen and, and the question if they might stay. So for example, we've seen that operators are suddenly able to roll out um, bandwidth very quickly. Are they able to roll out equally much bandwidth in the near future? And why did it go so quickly? What were the, the problems here? But also about measurement data, um, Usually there are actually economical um, points why measurement data are not shared. So is that something that might change in future um, or not? So they, I think there are a lot of um, things we've been talking about, which are actually not technical points, but um, points where uh, economical decision was made. And the question is, does it change in future? Yeah, I think. Steven, um, I want to up level just a bit. Um, this is a. Uh, I'm going to be. I'm. I'm. I'm, I'm going to try to be brief. I promise, Stephen. Um, the. This is. A, the, I, I want to make a point that that you know usually doesn't. Uh, we'll just make the point. Um, there is one of the things that we that I, I would like to uh, talk about here just briefly is is the unintended, unintended consequences that we've seen for having the internet in society during this time. I'm up leveling it. I'm not talking about just, you know, unintended consequences in particular fields or particular areas of network, uh, uh, of the network and so on, but just generally in society. And I think there's some some uh, points on the chat that are being made about this. So one example is, as Jared said, I completely agree that we should be grateful for the things that the network has made possible. I'm 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 very deeply aware of that, and, and I think about that all the time. This is uh, uh, the the problem, however, is is for example, schools have continued to go on as uh, things moved online. However, uh, having you know dealing with uh, two teenage children who are now going to school right now online, that is a completely disastrous and sucky experience, and it's actually in in some ways made it. Uh, worse for some students and has has uh, uh, been worked amazingly well for some others. This is true across the board. In meetings now, when I go in, one of the first things for the past six months, I've started my meetings with this, how is everybody doing? And some people are actually falling off the cliff, despite the fact that you're, you're supposed to continue working as though things are normal. The curriculum at school is continuing as though things are normal. It's going at the same pace. But so we are producing something here that is quite different. We have to be cognizant of that. There are some unintended consequences. Things are continuing as though they are normal, where maybe putting the brakes hard might actually be the right answer. Uh, I'm not saying that's what should be done. I'm just saying that there is something here to think about carefully. Um, just because we have the facade of school happening doesn't mean that school is actually happening or meaningful education is actually happening. So in a, on a broader scale, we know that the pandemic has deepened the not just the digital divide but existing inequalities or inequities in society in in so many ways and to the extent that technology amplifies intent i believe that all technology all it does it amplifies intent um i do want us to think about what the internet has done for society during this time 
what intent has it amplified and what divides it has amplified. This is uh, not just about technical architecture, but about what we want to build for society, broadly speaking. And um, what do we want to amplify? What did we end up amplifying? Yeah, uh, actually, I mean, I, I think one interesting thing I, I noticed is that I think a lot of the time the contention that our students suffer from is not related to the network, but devices and rooms and houses um, is the real kind of choke point, choke point for a bunch of people as well. So, uh, so I think Oliver, sorry, go ahead, Jenna. And I just very briefly want to say that my, my, my point here was so much was much more about education itself, right? And if we think that uh, teaching is if if we if we believe that the value here of education is is dumping information down into a student, then sure we managed it. But that's what I'm talking about as values. Like we are we are facilitating some things, but I don't think we are clear about exactly what it is that we should be facilitating. And if we are facilitating the things that we want to be, this is really a question about values, about intent, and that's. A much higher level conversation. We are building a, a, a we are building technology which is amplifying intent, whether we want to or whether we like it or not. But I think as engineers, we try to walk away from intent and simply say, well, all I'm doing is building this security piece or this bandwidth piece or whatever it is. But we are the ones building this technology. We are the ones who are amplifying these that we are amplifying. Okay, uh, Alor. So um, I'm just thinking like about what are the lessons learned from the three sessions that we had and like going back to bringing like what you started earlier, bringing structure into what did we actually discuss? What did we actually learn from that? Um, to my perspective, so there's always like two sides of a coin that these discussions fall into. So um, we can take on, on one side of the coin, we have the success story that in general, the internet worked very well. So right now we are having this meeting here, virtual, it's all working. We have webcams on, it does a great job. So, and this is what we have seen in, in some of the talks. Then on the other side of the coin, we have a lot of punctual issues. So isolated issues and for example, oh, there was uh, congestion at the spearing link. Oh, there was an edge cluster, an edge cache, cl uh, cache cluster of a CDN that got overloaded. Oh, there was like um, um, a, a certain set of students didn't have access to like proper bandwidth to consume study material for um, their, uh, their, their, their online courses. So that's a lot of isolated issues. We have a lot of understanding about this one. So we saw a lot of data points on this one. And then we have the general perspective on, yeah, the internet as such didn't broke down. There's of course some stuff that we didn't understand quite well from um, the perspectives that we have taken so far. So on the general perspective, um, we have this interesting discussion about the digital divide. So we saw some data points on the DSL access capacities and how this uh, correlates to income uh, regions. This was very interesting, but you know, this is clearly something like how the digital divide was being boosted by this whole situation. This is something that we probably don't have, like it's a general aspect that we don't have um, a good understanding of. On the isolated side, so the other side of the coin, um, we had lots of discussions about um, how we can map all of these isolated issues, congestion here, um, overloaded links there, other things, um, how to map this into like the general perspective, um, how to create like an abstract and an and, and abstract view on that. So I think that this is something that we're missing. We can play the same game on what Brian said. Did we get lucky or did we not get lucky? So on one side of the coin, I would argue that we didn't get lucky or it wasn't just pure luck um, because like a lot of the changes that we have seen so that, um, you know, all the well-equipped ISPs managed to quickly provision bandwidth and that we, for example, have robots in the meet me rooms of peering facilities and IXPs and so on that, you know, don't suffer from lockdowns and can still like establish cross connects. That's not luck. That's like very proper engineering and that helped us a lot. 
On the other hand, I would say, so that's the other side of the coin, we probably got lucky, you know, that um, these, these, these traffic changes didn't got to an extreme. So over provisioning um, and, you know, shifts in the peak times, um, they probably saved us quite a lot. So this could have been like way worse. And I would say that on this side, we got lucky. Okay, so I think we have, uh, Yari has like about four slides. Um, so Yari, and we have 20 minutes. So I, I suspect Yari's four slides could take up uh, 20 minutes plus 20 hours, but. Uh, I, I, I would only like to speak for like two or three minutes, um, but um, can I share instead of you, because I have updates. Oh, yeah, okay, sure, you can. Do I have to do, do something? I think I'll just press share and see if it works. Maybe I just hit stop sharing. Uh, but then I do want to try and get feedback on the format of this workshop, which itself is an experiment. We'll see my um, screen now. Not yet. You're not sharing yet, or we're not seeing you sharing. Maybe I can pilot you. Oh, Yeri has the bubble. I'm sorry. I can't hear you. <laughs> Maybe that's the problem that you were. You have the sharing bubble, but you're not sharing it. Okay. Um, well, let, let, let's go with Steven's uh, version. Then. No, it's Please. coming. It's coming. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we are. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, so I, I just want to go through this real quick. It's not the summary of the workshop. It's uh, my personal summary. And, and sort of, I guess this, this is the uh, Oliver's uh, two sides of the coin first. So on, on one hand, we had like a reasonably good situation. The internet really worked well. I think we can say that. Um, we also have lots of wonderful data by you all and of course others in the world about what actually happened. And as has been reported, there were lots of people and organizations that were very motivated to make sure that stuff actually works and everybody gets, gets the thing. And uh, I, I think we can also say that the internet actually is, is well suited for adapting to these new, new situations for various reasons. So that's all good. Um, but the other side of the coin is, if I can switch, let's see if I can, yeah, here we go. So the other side of the coin is that, um, you know, even if we have some measurements, we can't actually observe everything. It's, it's very limited. We can't be you know, basically looking at packets instead of like, uh, well, we're measuring packets and the, the real measurement, I guess, is like, did this kid graduate from school as, as planned or not? So, so there's a lot of sort of room for, for doing more maybe and trying to understand what the effects of this are. We also have limited means to control traffic. Like even if I wanted to, you know, have high priority for this versus something else, I couldn't. Um, we have limited ways for networks and apps to collaborate. Um, we had one type of situation. Uh, we could, of course, argue that in a different situation, um, the, the results could differ. Uh, we also have this situation that the internet is now far more important for all of us um, than it was before. Uh, we also have, you know, just talked about this digital divide and other societal effects. Um, so clearly, there's room for making things better. So just because it, it, it worked well doesn't mean that we were free to not do anything. We have to make it better. Um, but of course, there's also like this all these other improvements. Then, and we I, I think we entered some of that discussion today that um, uh, you know security and so forth that that we already knew that that we have a huge problem here, here, and there, and uh, we need to deal with that uh, pandemic or not. Um, then I also wrote this uh, to-do list in kind of in two categories like this. What can we do to understand the uh, the internet state better, uh, better like you know, distribute your measurement information better, uh, even you know like talking about it in in the society. So you know this is what the internet is doing and it's how it's helping and this is where we need to improve and so on. And, and then continuing expanding the coverage of the things that we measure, but then also measuring these additional things like quality of experience. 
Um, and the other category is um, system improvements or ecosystem improvements. And um, so it's not just about technical stuff. Either. Like the IETF in particular always wants to write an RFC, but um, but you know a lot of this is also like you know how did the people in the different uh, operators talk to each other? Were they able to find each other and so on? That may not be an RFC or technical thing, but could be a thing that we need to improve, or maybe not. Maybe it's already perfect, and you know, everybody knows everybody in Nanoc anyway. So what's the problem? Um, the other side of this is that like this education, implementation, improvement, security practices, there's a lot of stuff that it's outside standards and may need some work. But then on the st like technical standards and technology level, we could talk about like network app collaboration, perhaps at this aggregate level that uh, was, was being mentioned by Jana. Um, note that I didn't discuss like this DSCP bits or prioritization because that seemed like <laughs> Almost not not possible. Um, we've talked about resilience. Uh, we talked about the potential effects of centralization or consolidation, and how that may impact things. We we talked about DDoS defense. Um, that was part of the reason that I, I said earlier that we should look at other things than, than this current pandemic because we could have a situation where we're actually being bombarded by by some network attacks, and um, that could also be a bad, bad situation. So maybe that, that should be part of our toolkit. And, you know, we're not as good with that as, as we perhaps should be. Um, and then obviously, uh, uh, we will need to have resource reservations and uh, full control by the authorities, because otherwise nothing will work correctly. Um, and this is a joke. We didn't get that. Um, Anyway, so that, that that was my piece, and I'll uh, stop talking now. Maybe I'll stop sharing, unless people have questions on this. So I think I'm sharing my screen now. Does that has that become visible to people? Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, so we have we're down like the last ten minutes. So um, I guess we'll take two things together. If people have you know, stuff that hasn't been mentioned already, that might or actions that are pretty concrete, um, we can list a couple of those. And if there's any feedback on the format, because again, I I think that's useful because it's the first time we've done this kind of thing. Um, so input, please. And again, just join the queue if it turns into needing a queue. And if you're the first one, just start to start talking. So, uh, Jared here. I, I just wanted to comment briefly. I, I think this this worked out reasonably well uh, for a format, especially having it distributed over three days. I think helped make it uh, you know a a lot easier to to pay attention. Uh, I'm, I'm also Wondering out loud as I'm as I'm reading news of further lockdowns, whether or not you know this maybe is something we revisit in a few months as well. But I, I think the format worked re relatively well, and I'm very happy with the participation that we had. Uh, Kirsty and then Andrew and Brian. So Kirsty. Yeah, thank you. Um, just on the format, I thought it was uh, good to have it over three days, to have short sessions, um, appreciated the break in the middle as well. I think um, it would have been helpful to have slides and a bit more notice of time. Um, I don't know how everyone else found scheduling this quite quite quickly, but uh, it was it was difficult. Um, it is good to have it near IETS as well. So my brain is like in that sort of space. Um, but yeah, thank you for running it. I know it's difficult to collate and bring people together when they're all distributed working, but no, I thought it, overall it was it was good. Just a few things for improvement. Thank you. And following on the, on the positivity first, uh, completely agree with everything Kirsty just said. Um, pretty much, I particularly agree. Actually, doing it over three days with with a, a day's gap in between. Uh, was useful for reflection, and so I think that that was uh, especially uh, um, helpful. Um, I'm also uh, extremely relieved that that Jason has remained positive. Um, good to see he's confirmed that in the uh, chat. 
Uh, so I think that's an amazing achievement uh, that should be noted. Um, uh, and then finally, on, on the other column on, on, on the actions, I, I think it is just worth posing the question, is the direction of travel of resilience of the internet uh, going up or down? My personal contention is it's going down, but I think that, that's something which needs paying attention to. And I don't know if there's any way, any metric that could be constructed to to measure that over time, but uh, I think it will be a, a good thing to try. Brian? Yeah, so I'm uh, a gigantic fan of this format as well, especially with the days off in between, although I, I would like to hear feedback on the format from somebody in uh, PST, so UTC minus seven, um, because I suspect that waking up that early in the morning three days in a row is just, or three days not in a row, like sort of just messes up your whole sleep schedule. I also noticed that we don't have any Australians on the call as I, um, as I see. So maybe there's like some selection bias on how awesome uh, this particular time was. Um, with respect to resilience going up and down, I think we could have an entire other workshop on that. Uh, plus one to, I forget who it was, uh, uh, Jared, I think on revisiting this, you know, we're going back into lockdown or we're going back into, we're going to have a winter revisiting this in the spring and seeing how the internet did. I think revisiting later, I'd like to spend a little bit less time on the, the infrastructure unless the infrastructure just man like happens to blow up, um, which I don't think it will. Um, and a little bit more time on John's questions, right? Like, so the internet is good at amplifying the things the internet is good at amplifying. And we've done a really good job of making sure we can keep doing that. Um, and I think that sort of next, you know, by the next time we go through one of these experiences, we'll have more information or, or at least anecdotes about what's, um, uh, you know, what it's good at and what it's bad at, or more information and anecdotes about sort of what the societal impacts are. And I'd like to dig into those a little bit more. Might need a slightly different guest list, but um, please put me on it. Okay, the queue is currently empty. Um, I guess I have another question, is, you know, if, which I typed in the chat. If, we, if the IAB or somebody is organizing a workshop like this in future, after we can all travel again, what bits of this format should we try keep? Or should we just go right back to all traveling to Switzerland and having cheese in funny ways? <laughs> ben. Well, I actually queued myself before you asked that question, but I think I can address that a bit too. Uh, I like the three-day format. And the thing I particularly like about the three-day format is that it gives people time to think about what was said one day before you come back for another day. And if we were doing it in person, the three-day format might be harder with that extra time. Uh, and if there was some way to preserve that, you know, the ability to go back and cogitate and maybe have side conversations and then come back to the subject the, the next day. I think it would be good. Um, I put myself in the queue actually to say that I like the three-day format, but uh, I want to have a push a counter opinion about doing it right before the ITF. And this may just be me, but what I've got happening this week is several different activities. They're all trying to get a lot of work in because they all know I'm not available next week. And it's not so much that they contend for specific time or time slots, but they're happening across different time zones. So, you know, I've got this being moderately early morning, other things that are late night, and suddenly it's going to be kind of like next week where there's no period where one can get a, a full night of sleep in. And that was exaggerated by the, you know, being right before the ATF. But I understand other people like to do all their ATF thinking kind of in a, in a t period of time together, and it helps them. So it works both ways. Uh, Maria, I think, unless I missed somebody, in which case, apologies. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think that the big value of the three day format was that we actually had some time in the meantime to chat and discuss and so on. So maybe we can go for some hybrid format. We have some online discussion first and then maybe meet. 
in person for dinner or whatever. I don't know. It's it's also missing a little bit the side conversations and the coffee breaks um, about uh, actions or conclusions. So I'm I um, I think I even so I read the papers and and these kind of things. I think I learned a lot about um, really understanding the situation a little bit better, um, how things happen, what work well, and so on. I'm not sure I um, got a lot of actions out of that. And maybe I have to review the minutes we've been taking. But maybe the main point really about this workshop is just to document and what we've learned so we get like a common understanding what happened or we can can just you know have a, increase our understanding of, about how the internet works robin okay uh, this is Romy. Uh, in fact, I'm okay with the format of this the workshop, uh, though it's a little hard because uh, this is uh, a little late, but uh, it's also uh, very exciting to discuss the, with everyone. Uh, but, uh, you know, this, the, uh, regarding these actions and conclusions, I think uh, from my own point of view, I think uh, uh, in this process, I, I uh, I have one this point I think is important is the automation because you know that is because we talk about it sometime there's the uh, the experience of the user is not good in the in the process of the COVID-19 but I want to know this how our the application and the network uh, respond to this the to this uh, to this work and uh, uh, how long will it take because this is also an important uh, performance of our network and the application. But uh, but uh, the but it seems that is we always talk about the internet uh, capacity is okay. But uh, from my point of view, maybe the automation of the network adjustment is can also be taken into account. That's my point. Okay, so I've tried to capture that, Robin. To, we can correct it later if I get it wrong, which I may have done. Uh, okay, we're kind of at three minutes to the hour. Um, I basically, I, I guess, I just like to say thanks to everybody for turning up for the really interesting discussions. Uh, I will, you know, we will try to uh, copy the all the text from the pad without deleting it first. Um, that'd be good, um, and produce a workshop report um, that will be, I guess, done on the, in the Git repo. Maria, I think, has created a template or, or a, a draft, initial draft. Um, and I think that's it, unless anybody else from the program committee wants to also say thanks for turning up or something similar. Maybe a note on the on the uh, report. So I already um, also created some sections for the measurement part. So if those people who presented want to actually put some sentences there, that would be very welcome. Uh, otherwise, other input is also uh, welcome, of course. Um, and with that, also thank you from my side. I really enjoyed it. Um, thank you for everybody engaging so nicely, pro providing slides kind of last minute like. Okay, thanks. And we're finishing right on time. So uh, I hope to actually see all you guys sometime soonish over food and beverages. Uh, it's <laughs> Although I also like this format, it's much better to actually <laughs> meet really face to face. But hopefully we'll do that in the not too distant. And I think with that, let's kind of you know close proceedings and go to the bar, whatever your nearest bar is. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, hey. Stephen. Thanks. Yep, thanks. Uh, thanks. If you're the last one here, it's exactly the chat. Somebody wanted the chat. Jared, I didn't hear that because of the profound beeps. <laughs>
You can stop the recording.